Thank you. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, David gave you a, a very whirlwind tour of what we've been up to, and I think it's a pretty impressive list of things that we've been doing as an organization and as a community. Um, it always floors me to see how much the project's got his hands in and what, what, what they're accomplishing and how all these things are fitting together. David's been leading a tremendous amount of effort and has really rallied a great group of people, as you saw, doing a lot of just outstanding things. And my goal here in this talk is to sort of talk not so much about the project, there was a little bit of it, but also sort of in the larger questions is in the security community, what we're dealing with and sort of the challenges uh, in the honeypot space. So I come to you sort of not as the Arbor guy anymore, but now as the chairman of the board and a big picture guy. I think anybody who sort of knows me knows that I'm, um, I talk a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of ideas and I don't necessarily follow through on all of them and that's why I like to reach out to other people. But um, this talk is really about sort of several different ideas that are coming out of some conversations I'm having with some folks um, and other folks I know are having with each other around where we are. It's 2012. We spent the better part, you know, well over a decade now in the honey nuts, in the honey pot space with honey networks and the like. And we're running into some really interesting sort of problems. How do we keep up with new technologies? How do we keep up with new attackers and the like? And what does this all mean? David touched upon some of these challenges. I'm going to touch upon only a handful of them and some of the broader themes that tie them together. Don't confuse these with research priorities for the project, but rather these are sort of much larger questions that we're having. When I went and was preparing these slides, I took some time and I said, okay, what are people talking about for the future of honeypots? And one of the neat things that sort of popped up was a set of um, goals and, and it looked really, really ambitious back in about 2001. And I'm really proud to say that we've hit on all of them and so much more as you saw with David. But we really hit upon all of these really, really solidly. Um, through lots of bright people's hard efforts, we really knocked it out of the park. So the goal was, of course, you know, take our point solutions that we had, running a, maybe a home DSL line, or in a uh, university dorm room, or in a university rack, and that kind of thing, and how can we get bigger visibility into the global landscape of attackers? How can we scale this up? How can we make sense of all of this? And distribute this effort, right? How can we get more people involved? How can we coordinate our findings? And what's it going to take to do that? And so the challenge that was laid out at the time was the idea that became the globally distributed Honey Net and even projects outside uh, the Honey Net project like Arbor's Atlas, uh, Team Cymru, D-Shield, uh, Semantic, many other efforts that have gone on in this space. And so we largely, I would say, solved that one, right? And David's talked about some of the technologies that are going into sort of current spaces in this space, like HP feeds, and how the different elements tie together. There's still a tremendous amount of challenge that we're facing with regards to present, presenting this data, bring it to the user, bring it to the operator, finding interesting things inside of that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. This is, I think, where the current challenge lies, not so much in how can we coordinate systems all over the world, but rather how can we take all that data and make sense of it. Secondly, the idea was to go from sort of bare metal boxes that you had to babysit on occasion um, and really sort of get into, and then get into virtualization and emulation. And there's a number of different projects in this space. And this is a not exhaustive list. This is just a, a couple of them um, that, again, really sort of pushed the, the boundaries and I think now we take for granted. But at the time, were a significant amount of engineering effort, research effort, and have proven to be very, very powerful. Honeydee from Niels Provost, for example, is a tremendously powerful product, right? It's user lens stack, TCP IP stack, pluggable modules, you can scale tremendously large in it. And Neil's banged this out, it's in like a week or so. He just sees a tremendously strong coder and a really bright engineer and a really bright guy now over at Google and has really done a tremendous job there. It was really cool is you could just drop in these little scripts and you can start to emulate things. So he, he, did, he did more than just build a small tool, he built a really nice framework that has proven itself to be very, very useful in lots of different areas. This lets us scale up easily and emulate thousands of hosts all over the world, and if not millions in some cases, and um, gather lots of data with simple drop-in scripts, which is really cool. 
Other tools like Nepenthes and NW Collect are built upon a very simple um, premise, and that is not to do the real uh, vulnerability, but rather emulate the vulnerability, specific vulnerabilities, do some pattern matching on the traffic that comes in and respond appropriately. So a little more development work, but again, modular, you could write a, a module for, say, a vulnerability, drop it in there, it starts listening, um, and begins to fingerprint some traffic, collect it, and even you could have different vulnerabilities in the same service, uh, like, for example, all the ones on TCP 445, um, you could stack them on there, and it would sort of know how to fork them appropriately. Again, really, really powerful. This is really great for th grabbing malware. This is really great for sort of taking the temperature, if you will, of the internet, and had really sorts of really cool things on the back end where it would have TFTP downloads, FTP downloads, HTTP downloads, and the like, and really sort of go out of its way to um, gather up a tremendous amount of malware out there. Really, really powerful tools. And, uh, in all cases. And again, the idea of emulating, rather than real bare metal systems, provide a significant window into very, very large scale uh, behaviors out there. And then as David was talking about some of the honey clients, again, back when this uh, beginning of the last decade, this was sort of one of our challenges. We were very much server focused. It was really easy to stand up a Windows box, stick it out there, see what happened to it, do some forensics, come back with some answers. But what was happening, what, you know, to the clients at the time, whether they be email, um, chat, uh, or just regular sort of uh, browsing, was starting to sort of emerge as, as an attack surface, and we had no idea how we would measure this. So things like Capture HBC from uh, Christian, Forney C, from myself and Angelo, and now Angelo's Thug project, these are some, just some of the handful of the tools that we've built over the years to really get deep insights into this landscape. And again, really, really powerful insights into the types of attacks going on here. And again, there's a lot of work to be done. We cracked this, uh, we cracked this nut and we really sort of uh, broke through. And my, my point is sort of that we can outline a, a very sort of set of challenges. The things that come out of it, I think, are we soon take for granted. Um, but it's important to remember where you came from. Remember that this project, the Huntington Project and its membership, have a great track record of outlining the, the current research agendas and nailing them, and so much more. So the three big things that I see, and again, these are sort of where we're talking, some of us are talking, and we're trying to sort of nail down some research ideas, uh, either within the project or other people are starting to face, and these are the three big things I see sort of driving that, right? One is, um, the rise of big data, the dramatic rise of big data in the past several years. Facebook's a great place to discuss this because of Facebook's efforts uh, in the big data space around Cassandra and a whole bunch of other tools in the space. Um, Facebook are clearly a big data shop. Um, lots of talented engineers here, so um, you guys basically know this. This is great. Social, obviously, you guys know you sort of the, the, uh, uh, the single largest social space out there. Dramatic rise in social uptake, dramatic rise in social threats that we have very little visibility into, very little systemic visibility into. And finally, mobile. Again, as David sort of brought up, um, we are doing some things in mobile, but again, these are very nascent efforts. These are three large sort of technologies that are both out there providing challenges, new landscapes, and new opportunities as a result of that. And I'll talk about them uh, in, the next in the next several slides of the next, uh, geez, half hour or so. And this is sort of where some of us are stuck, right? We're dealing with these very, very sophisticated attackers. These guys know exactly who they're targeting. These guys know exactly what they're after. And we're finding it difficult with the tools that we have to sort of get into their heads, get into their game, and discover what it is that they're up to. We've had a, um, well, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be frank, we've had some discussions about how we're not sort of getting insights. And some of it comes down to the tools that we're deploying, right? We're sort of deploying these tools that are generic, real easy to, to launch, but are not necessarily giving us insights into very specific kinds of attackers. Again, about 10 years ago, the idea was we could use honeypots as a defensive mechanism as well. So not just insights into attackers, but again, draw them over there, get them to waste their time and effort, get some insights, figure out who they are quickly, blacklist them maybe at the border, and protect your real assets. This is still a dream. This is, I think, even more so 
uh, than it had been in the past to sort of a goal uh, now with, again, the targeted attacks. The question is, how do we get there? So it's important that we know the attacker community that we're facing. We cannot stand up generic systems like Nepenthes or like Honeyd and hope to just sort of lure them in. You have to build a tremendous amount of backstory and ecosystem around them to get the attackers convinced that this is an asset or this, these are assets that, you're, that they're after. So again, it's going to require a lot of effort on our part. This is sort of where some of us are starting to come, in, starting to come into this. It's going to require some effort on our part to understand the attacker landscape, begin to sort of present to them an image, an idea that they can now start to attack and move into this space. So how can we entice them in, right? How can we create the appearance Again, this is all deception. How can we create the appearance that this, what they're after is right over here? Yes, please come in, have a look around, grab what you want, uh, maybe with a little bit of effort, fingerprint them this way. This is going to require a lot of effort. We know this. So we're finding that these guys have a lot of really serious motivations. Rather than sort of running along, sort of uh, like a little kid might, you know, checking who's got, who left the cars unlocked in the parking lot, these guys are really right after a very specific set of um, goods, these guys have very deep motivations, are willing to invest time and effort in profiling the victim organization or the victim sector in some cases and the organizations within there, what it is they're after, how to get in, what are the weak points, what are the likely places for them to get into it, and how are they going to try and break in slowly, methodically, devote some time to this. Frankly, we cannot get into this game. We cannot get into the cycle with them unless we're willing to put in the same kind of time and effort. And these are some of the, the challenges that we're facing at this point. These guys are not easily fooled by honeypots, right? These guys are able to sort of quickly spot, hey, I'm in the fake landscape. So how can we up our game as well in this space? How can we up our game? How can we um, present to them a truly compelling picture that they're operating in? And how can we do this? And this, these are some of the questions that we're facing here. On the big data front, I really love this graphic from O'Reilly from a few years ago that sort of shows the stack, right? So you've got fast data on the bottom, big analytics in the middle, and services on top. And you can sort of go up and down and figure out where you want to be in terms of speed, scale, and what you want to offer, and what's required, what kinds of technologies are required to start thinking about in this space. And I use this a lot. I've actually spent a lot of time right now in fast data. We more or less have solved the fast data problem, spending much of time at big analytics, a couple of these things that are canned, but really focusing on this proprietary code right here, um, largely. Anyhow, this is the kind of stuff that has, I think, a tremendous revolution available to us. David mentioned that I, this is a tremendous uh, truism that we have more data than we know what to do with at this point. The feeds are great, it's highly structured data, tons of them you can publish, you can subscribe, you can do whatever you want in this space. The question is now, how do you make sense of it? And this is great because it's requiring us to sort of get back to, go back to school, learn some new technologies, learn some new paradigms. I'm loving it, frankly, because I've learned so much in the past four years in this space as a means of trying to solve problems in this top services sector here in the blue. How can I uh, get there and so I have to sort of learn a whole bunch of new, neat new things in this space? What's great is there's a plethora of tools out there now to do this. There's no shortage of decks, slide decks, and people talking about this space. You can get into this sort of, not just dipping your toes into it, but sort of dump, dive into their whole full body and sort of learn all this stuff. This is a lot of fun. It's, uh, for me, it's like Computer Science 201. This is a blast. As a point of um, disclosure, I have zero formal training in computer science, by the way. I just hang out with a lot of really bright guys, bought the used textbooks, and sort of did this on my own. Anyway, um, but again, the goal here is sort of gain significant insights, right? Not just here's a graphic sort of showing RDP scans and attackers over the past um, week or two, but now here are the kinds of attacks being leveraged against, say, financial services or educational institutions with government contracts. Here's the kinds of... Um, time and effort that people are spending on sort of getting into this. These are the kind of things that we really want to get to. This is where we really want to go. And again, swimming in the sea of data, how can we leverage these tools? How can we leverage this data to help us get to these answers and this understanding? Big data, 
you know, it's the current mantra, it's great, I'm loving it, it's a lot of fun, but this is, I think, where we need to sort of learn a lot, invest a lot of our time and effort into this space, and go beyond just simple two-dimensional plots, and now really into deeper, deeper, deeper analytics that provide that kind of insight and understanding, so we can, again, retarget our efforts, focus our efforts, be where they want it, be, be where they expect us to be, so we can be attacked and we can gain some insights, distract them if we can, and the like. Um, one of the other things that's really important here, I think, to know, and again, this is a great thing coming out of Honey Cloud and with the HP feeds, I have a very simple definition of big data. One is if you can download it, if you can move it without contracting with a shipping company, you're not in big data. That's what it comes down to. So what do you got to do? You got to co-locate your code now with the data. And the Honey Cloud and the HP feeds, I think, provide that. This is a tremendous sort of new way of thinking. This is great. This is a lot of fun. We've got the infrastructure in the project. Now we need to sort of, I think, spend the time and effort in this. We're all volunteers. This is a bit challenging because we're all volunteers. I've got two kids and a wife. A lot of people have wives and kids and, and spouses and kids, I should say. And this is great because, you know, we're happy people and, and the like. But we, can, um, but we also have full-time day jobs. How can we uh, keep this up? This is a big challenging, but it's great for sort of the younger guys who have the time and energy to spend in this. We can sort of move into this help them and, and grow them and the like. Where I'm going with that is we got to invest the time and the effort in this. And this is, I think, um, where some of us are starting to talk and spend our time and uh, thinking about. Social is, you know, sort of the, 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 big, the big one here, right? Facebook, we love you guys. I'm actually not a Facebook user. My wife's a big Facebook user. <laughs> I use Twitter a lot. I probably should have put MySpace up there. But anyway. <laughs> Um, I do use LinkedIn on occasion as well, but the idea is that this is a tremendously powerful way of thinking about it. Good guys use social, bad guys use social, right? They're using it also for attacks. I'm going to detail some of the attacks that we've seen here as well. But the idea is the attackers are basically pretending to be good guys, and they get into the, to our social circles, again, through deception, again, through uh, mimicry, and they can sort of start mapping out what's going on in our world so let's flip the script, right? Let's get into their heads. Let's get into their circles. Let's get into their worlds by, again, maybe uh, building some trust, impersonating them, getting in here. This takes time and effort, but it can be done, right? Because we can start to gain their trust, gain, hear their secrets, map out how they work. Again, understanding uh, the underground and the, the attackers, their motivations, their tools and techniques, is a key goal of the project, or key mission in the project. This is, I think, a tremendous way to do it. We don't, you know, maybe they hang out on Facebook and discuss these things, but they probably aren't uh, that stupid in most cases. So there's, I think, other things that we can be doing, and I think that, whether it be in IRC or their forums or the like, these are places, I think, that we need to start thinking about investing our time and effort, possibly through automation, and getting in there. So maybe we can receive their materials falsely. We do this sort of, you know, at work, we do this sort of uh, um, ad hoc. How can we structure this and grow this and, and improve this? This is a, sort of a, a dicey area to play in. But I think that, again, this is the kind of area that the project and projects in general in this space need to spend a lot of time thinking about. There's some financial questions here with regards to possible legality, certainly ethics, and risks involved in this, both to people and, and organizations. How can we make sense of this? One I didn't get a, one shining example of, of that that I didn't get a chance to um, get some screenshots for is the, the Operation Dark Market, where the US FBI basically took over a, a bulletin board and personally into the operators in the space, entered into criminal circles uh, falsely, and basically mapped out who the players were, what their activities were, gathered tremendous logs, and then foop swept everybody up. Tremendously awesome opportunity for them to do that. How can we do this, not being law enforcement, but how can we do this and gain the insights into what these guys are doing in sort of a much more um, scalable way and a much, much larger scale? On the reverse of this, I'm sorry to do this to you guys, Ryan. There was an attack disclosed uh, about a week ago where um, what we believe is a nation state basically stood up a Facebook page for NATO's supreme uh, commander and impersonated him. He's pictured here. He's a kind of guy, you know, looks like a typical Facebook user, right? <laughs> 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 I 
But seriously, um, and this went on for months, and they were able to map out other NATO people and people involved with NATO and other efforts on, um, on Facebook and use, a lot, use that information against the organization after that. If you know who the trusted contacts are, you can, of course, send email from them, you can impersonate them and the like, and begin to impersonate their voice and talk about um, events or uh, activities that are expected to be talked about and go on from there. This is the kind of attack I'm talking about, right? So this was obviously committed against a, a military organization, a pan, um, pan, uh, transatlantic uh, military organization. How can we do this against the bad guys, right? How can we do this against them by impersonating people within their circles and moving that forward? So this is the kind of thing that I think would be a tremendous um, operation for us to be able to do. Speaking of scalability, by the way, um, if you haven't seen it, the Maltigo guys rolled to me. He's got a fantastic um, presentation that he gave, I think, a couple years ago at um, the CCDCOE conference in cyber warfare, where he sort of described how you can create tremendous amounts of fake profiles on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on and so forth, and control them in a realistic-looking fashion as a single individual to create the, the impression of popular opinion, whether it be for, hey, I love this movie or this TV show, or um, I support the government, or I were opposed to the government, and the like, and create this tremendously compelling picture. So again, this can be done automatically with a few individuals and some code. It's not that hard. So this is the kind of things we should be tackling. Here's another one. This was uh, out of Wired about a year ago, Primus, the Prime Morris era um, situation. So this is, this is amusing because this is basically a, a uh, um, Twitter account who sort of entice everybody in the intelligence community here in the US by pretending to be this sort of very attractive woman um, who was very accomplished in uh, analysis in the intel community. And she suckered a lot of people in, a lot of guys in. And this Wired story is really fantastic to read because there's a lot of guys basically saying, yep, let's face it, she had a pretty great looking uh, uh, profile picture I always suckered in. And I talked about things I probably shouldn't have talked about. So do we do this against the, the, uh, the bad guys as well? This is uh, her profile picture, um, faceless shot of a bikini. You know, let's face it, there's a lot of guys who are pretty lonely, um, <laughs> might be willing to um, talk to somebody who claims to know um, space and missile defense, rocket science, and defense uh, uh, intelligence community stuff. There's a lot of guys out there that think are smiling, thinking, yep, I probably would have fallen for that as well. 1,276 followers, um, and all sorts of really crazy mystery here. But this is, again, this is the kind of thing that I think that shows the true power of social media as a way of connecting with people, right? Flip the script, use it against the bad guys, draw them out, gain their confidence, draw them out, understand their motivations, and feed that back into the Defender community. Key stuff, key mission um, of the project. Moving on, mobile is a, um, both a technology as well as, I think, uh, sort of a social phenomenon as well. I mean, mobile is a, an outstanding technology to me, right? One is it's incredibly personal. Um, you know, you have your device on you at all times. It's got tons of personal information about you. The meta information about where it's located, who you're talking to, et cetera, is tremendously rich. It's a, from a technology standpoint, it's a tremendously wide open attack surface. Not a whole lot that we know about it and a whole lot that uh, um, we have visibility in. David talked a little bit about some of our project's efforts. For example, uh, the Android reverse engineering, the ARE image that we've produced, which bundles together a lot of tools, um, and some of the open areas we have. For example, I Apple's iOS, um, Windows Mobile, um, BlackBerry, and the like, other attack platforms. But again, this is something we're sort of getting our hands around as time goes on. This is, I think, a, a tremendously rich area, right? Tremendous growth globally. I think last year or the year before, more mobile devices sold than traditional PCs and laptops. Wildly popular. So that's, you know, not including just smartphones, but really any sort of feature phone and the like, sort of dumb phones. But again, tremendously popular. How can we, we should be paying attention to this, how can we scale this up, right? 
lots of, lots of uh, uh, room to grow, very, very little visibility, tremendous opportunity here. Last year was basically the year of Android malware. There's a graphic from McAfee showing quarter on quarter growth of new malware samples in the Android platform by quarter. And this is just through Q3 of 2011. The past two quarters, the current quarter and the Q4 2011, are even higher. So I, I had a really good laugh when, um, I think it was the lead security guy for Android over at Google was like, there's no, there's no Android mal uh, malware problem. It's all just made up by the AV companies. Um, we know it's, that's not the case. We know that this is actually a pretty accurate graphic. But again, finding these things and detecting them and qualifying them, doing something about them, gaining insights into that whole space is a perfectly natural fit to what the projects and these projects in the honey pot space should be focusing on. And we are, we're getting there. But it's going to require, I think, a lot of effort and a lot of time to think about this. It's not simply a matter of sort of transferring our current tool sets over there. There's a whole lot of new things that we should be thinking about. Some years ago, a Miko uh, Hypenin, Chief Research Officer over at F-Secure, used to walk around with a um, modified Nokia with um, uh, Bluetooth turned on. And he would pick up hits from Bluetooth worms. And you know, he's like, he'd be surprised how many were out there. Right? And he'd find them in hotel lobbies and the like, or the airports. I was really sort of interested to sort of see that. This is the kind of thing we should probably be following up with. Right? This is the kind of thing that, that we should be doing. I don't know if Bluetooth is still sort of the, the number one protocol people are sort of tackling there, but uh, um, this is, I think, worth paying attention to. All right. A couple of other needs, I think, that are sort of implicit in all of this, especially when we think about social, we think about big data, we think about uh, enticing guys in, right? We need this, we need generators of realistic but fake data. It has to look real, but it has to be fake. How can we produce that. This is a really big challenge, right? This is, I know, the kind of thing that stumps um, entire communities of text processing and text generation. But again, I think that, you know, we don't need to uh, have a silver bullet here. We can have a 70, 75% solution and be pretty happy with this. A couple of those, and man, you're sitting rather pretty. So all we got to do is basically fool the more sophisticated attacker into thinking, here's where I want to be. Here's who I want to attack. Here's where, where I want to attack. Here's how I want to attack. Here's what I want to smash and grab. Years ago, the project had talked about honey tokens, whether they be fake credit card numbers or other pieces that the idea was to insert it into the attacker's world and watch where it bubbles up. This is sort of hard to get our hands on because, well, financial firms are sort of freaky about that kind of thing. But there's other things we could be doing here. This is one way to do it. This is sort of a classic intelligence community methodology. You introduce some false information if you have a suspect, uh, say a suspect agent for the, the opposition, and see if it gets passed on and where it bubbles up. Pretty easy to do. How can we do this? Right? Because we, you know, we have two, di two different goals here. One is, I think, and they can work together. One is to draw somebody in who might be drawn to um, highly valuable or valuable looking materials. And secondly, watch where it goes. So we need to, some generations, in the, some generations in the space to do that here. And secondly, this is really what I'm trying to get here, get at here, is the human element, right? We're dealing not with machines, but with people. Yeah, we have great sensors for detecting malware. We have great sensors for these sorts of things. And we're wondering why we're not picking up interesting human attackers. If you put a dumb sensor out there, you're going to get sort of the dumb attacks. How can we raise the bar significantly, screen out the sort of dumb attacks, and instead wind up with the really interesting, juicy attacks, figure out what people are up to again. This is, I think, where we're sort of lacking. So this is a classic cat and mouse game, right? This takes time. This takes effort. This takes investment of resources and people and thinking. And you're gonna, your brain's going to hurt as you sort of play this chess game with some of these guys. But that's good. That's a lot of fun. And you really want to keep them on the hook. So you've got to be actively involved, right? You can't set it and forget it and come back two weeks later and wonder what happened. They're going to figure that out pretty fast. For those of you that haven't read it or it's been a while, I suggest you reread The Cuckoo's Egg, right? Man, that guy would sleep on his floor of his office, and if he, you know, he'd have things wake him up, and he'd wake up, and he'd groggily sort of go and interact with the attacker, right? Classic stuff. This is what it's going to take, I think. We can, of course, automate that. We're better engineers than he was. But we can do, we can, but we got to do this. We got to invest our time and effort in this space. 
There's a lot of tools available to us that were not available to us even five or 10 years ago that we can leverage in this space to make this easier. But the idea is to draw them out, right? I had a fantastic conversation with somebody sort of about the, the, the classics in this space, right? The idea is your attacker wants to know as much about you as possible because they're confident in what they know about themselves. So you've got to sort of flip that around, right? You've got to basically draw as much out of them as possible while, minim while exposing minimally as much about yourself. This is the challenge, and this is where it gets a lot of fun. But this is where I think we sort of forget the tremendous advantage that we have in this space. Cyber's greatest advantage is that everything is virtual. I'm real, I'm sitting on the stage, you're really sitting in the audience, my voice is real, etc. But when we're online, no matter who we're talking to, whether it be a friend, an, an enemy, a system, what have you, it's all virtual. We construct a reality in our heads. Remember this. We construct a reality in our heads based upon the expectations that we have, okay? You don't know if you're really talking to Gmail. You could be talking to a very clever facsimile of Gmail. And I, bet, I bet you, depending on how much you travel, you probably have. You don't know that. So let's use this to our advantage. This is a tremendous amount of advantage that we have. When we present an image to an attacker, it doesn't have to be us. It just has, we just have to fool that person into thinking they're talking to us. And at that point, we can do whatever we want. We control the horizontal, we control the vertical, we control everything. Your imagination is the limit. The technology is there, the capabilities are there, you've got plenty of friends to help you out. Just think about what you could do. Again, remember, whatever it is you do online is simply a construct of your expectations. Flip that around, alter their reality to meet their expectations. That's what I'm encouraging you to think about here. And as I talk about the future, as I talk about our challenges, remember, we're really firmly rooted in the past here, right? David and I were on the, over here, on the right over here. David was asking, you know, do, do I think that server side honeypots are still worthwhile? And the answer is an emphatic yes. Maybe even more so than ever, given the nature of the targeted attacks that we're seeing, either from you know, folks like LulzSec and AnonSec and those guys, or more sophisticated attackers. The data breach is king in the past two to three years. The data lives on servers, right? Server-side attacks, are, I think, are more important than ever. How can we get into that and figure that out? This is a tremendous blind spot for us. Server-side attacks and server-side emulation and impersonation, I think, is still key more than ever. I cannot em emphasize this enough, but deception is the name of the game, right? This is what's key to the whole thing. Again, that expectation that your attacker has that they're talking to a real asset, they're talking to a real system with real data on it is key to this whole thing. We've forgotten that. I think we've entirely forgotten the fact that we can control everything that we want to. Whether it be handoff from a real system over to a honeypot, whether it be an increasingly complex set of honeypots that they are thinking, wow, I'm inside the corporate network. But no, it's entirely a shadow organization, a, a creation, a, nothing but a hall of mirrors. This is up to us. Really, really easy to do here. And, and finally, you know, new technologies, whether it be V6, mobile, or anything like that, these are all, you know, just technologies. We can adapt to them. They bring special things to them. V6, for example, is a lot of weird things compared to V4. Nothing special other than that, right? We can adapt to them. The basic principles, I think, are still the same. And this is, I think, what we need to spend our time thinking about as we think about where we want to go, what we're getting right now, with what effort. My whole message really comes down to you get in which you get out what you put in. You get a tremendous reward if you put in some effort. And I think that we've got to invest ourselves in that uh, in the coming years through a variety of different uh, projects and even brainstorming sessions. And with that, I want to say thank you all very much. Thanks to the organizers from Facebook. Thanks to the organizers from the Huntington Project. And thanks to you for your time and attention today. Thank you. <laughs>